Good day and good evening. Thank you for standing by. Welcome to Tencent Holdings Limited 25 for second quarter results announcement webinar. I'm Wendy Huang from Tencent IR team. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. After the management's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. For participants who dial in by phone, if you wish to ask a question, please press 5 on the raise your hand. If you are accessing from the Tencent meeting or Google meeting application, please click the raise hand button at the bottom left. And please be advised that today's webinar is being recorded. Before we start the presentation, we would like to remind you that it includes forward-looking statements, which are underlined uh, by a number of risks and uncertainties, and it may not be realized in the future for various reasons. Information about general market conditions is coming from a variety of sources outside of Tencent. This presentation also contains some unaudited non-FIRS financial measures that should be considered in addition to, but not as a substitute for, measures of the group's financial performance prepared in accordance with IFRs. For a detailed discussion of risk factors and non-FIRS measures, please refer to our disclosure documents on the IR section of our website. Let me introduce the main team on the webinar tonight. Our chairman and CEO, Pony Ma, will kick off with a short overview. President Martin Lau and the Chief Strategy Officer James Mitchell will provide a business review. Chief Financial Officer John Lau will conclude with financial discussions before we open the floor for questions. I will now pass it to Pony. Great, thank you, Wendy. Good evening. Thank you everyone for joining us. Our second quarter, 2024 results demonstrate the strength of our platform plus content strategy. Our domestic games revenue resumed growth and our international game revenue accelerated growth due to increased user engagement as several of our evergreen titles and the successful launch of certain new games. Tencent Video achieved a notable audience and subscriber growth with drama series developed from China literature, IP, and produced internationally. In, in, internally. Looking forward, we continue to invest in our platforms and technologies, including AI, enabling us to create new business value and better serve use needs. Looking at our financial number for the quarter, Total revenue was 161 billion RMB, up 8% year on year and 1% quarter on quarter. Gross profit was 86 billion RMB, up 21% year on year and 2% quarter on quarter. Non IFRS operating profit was 58 billion RMB, up 27% year on year or flat quarter on quarter. Turning to our key services for communication and social networks. Combined MAU of Weixing and WeChat grew year on year and quarter on quarter to 1.37 billion. For digital content, Tencent Video led the industry in terms of audience and subscriptions. For games, our proactive the judgment to several of our leading games earlier in the year are yielding a positive results with healthy user chain for our evergreen games and substantial popularity for several new games. For cloud enterprise SaaS, Wecom and Tencent Meeting increased their penetration in major industry verticals and upsold more pay functionalities. I will now hand over to Martin and James for business review. Thank you, Pony, and uh, good evening and good morning to everybody. Uh, for the second quarter of 2024, our total revenue was up 8% year on year. VAS represented 49% of our total revenue, within which social network subsegment was 19%, domestic games subsegment was 21%, and international games was 9%. Online advertising was 19% of total revenue, and fintech and business services was 31% of total revenue. Turning to gross profit, our overall gross profit growth was 21% year-on-year in the second quarter, driven by growth in high-margin revenue streams, such as domestic games revenues, video accounts advertising revenues, 
mini games platform service fees and e-commerce technology service fees within video accounts, as well as cost-saving initiatives. By segment, vast gross profit increased 12% year-on-year to 45 billion RMB, representing 52% of our total gross profit. Online advertising gross profit increased 36% year-on-year to 17 billion RMB, contributing 19% of total gross profit. And fintech and business services gross profit increased 29% year-on-year to 24 billion RMB, contributing 28% of total gross profit. Moving into business by segment, for value-added services, segment revenue was 79 billion RMB, up 6% year-on-year. Social network revenue returned to positive growth up 2% year-on-year, driven by increased revenue from music and video subscriptions, mini games platform service fees, and app-based game item sales, which was partially offset by decreased revenue from music and games-related live streaming services. Long-form video subscription revenue increased 12% year-on-year, as average daily video subscriptions increased 13% year-on-year to $117 million. Consumers are increasingly seeking out high-quality IP and high production value in drama series. Our novel comics and games platforms nurture high-quality IPs, while our studios, including new classic media, create high-production value video content. During the first half of 2024, out of the top three most-watched drama series on China's online video platforms, The first and second were produced by New Classic Media and broadcast by Tencent Video, and all three were based on China literature web novel IPs. Music subscription revenue increased 29% year-on-year, supported by growth in subscriptions in Apple. TME strengthened cooperation with labels and artists, releasing original soundtracks for Tencent Video popular drama series, and provided live music experiences through offline events and concert tours. Domestic games revenue resumed growth up by 9% year-on-year to 35 billion RMB, mainly driven by Valorant and new title DNF Mobile. Total gross receipts of domestic games grew faster than revenue in the second quarter. International games revenue increased by 9% year-on-year in both reported and constant currency terms to 14 billion RMB, benefiting from the robust performance of PUBG Mobile, as well as contributions from Supercell Games. Total gross receipts of international games grew substantially faster than revenue in the second quarter. For communications and social network, we enhanced functionalities and enriched content across our platforms, including video accounts, mini programs, and Tencent channels. For video accounts, the user time spent increased significantly year-on-year in the second quarter, benefiting from enhanced algorithms and more local content. Our thriving content ecosystem enabled creators to reach a wider audience and generate increased revenue. The number of creators that generate closed-loop revenue from their video accounts more than tripled year-on-year, showing a much more vibrant content ecosystem. To facilitate e-commerce activity, we're enhancing transaction capabilities in a systematic way to deliver a seamless shopping experience to users and drive sales for merchants. Mini programs have become an increasingly powerful platform for users to connect with merchants and content providers offline and online. Total user time spent on mini programs increased over 20% year-on-year in the second quarter. GME facilitated by mini programs grew double-digit percentage year-on-year. For mini games, total gross receipts increased over 30% year on year. And as a testimony to the diversity of the games, more than 140 mini games each achieved total gross receipts of over 10 million RMB during the quarter. Lastly, Tencent Channels served as a community based platform in which moderators can manage and present content and events via customizable tools, while users can interact via text, image, and live streaming. We recently upgraded and rebranded Tencent Channels, previously known as QQ Channels, 
And our users can join channels from Weixin and from game apps in addition to QQ. Tencent channels have gained notable popularity among game players and university students, while early adopters and promoters of channels advanced functionalities. With that, I'll pass to James. Thank you, Martin. Moving on to domestic games, Peacekeeper Elite grew its gross receipts by a double-digit percentage year on year in the second quarter. With popular Egyptian-themed and anime-themed outfits, we introduced Metro Royale, an extraction shooter game mode that's already proven attractive in PUBG Mobile, and which resulted in Peacekeeper Elite's DAU resuming year-on-year -year growth in July. Honor of Kings also increased its gross receipts year-on-year -year in the second quarter, benefiting from adjustments we made that spread out the timing of high-value virtual item sales throughout the year, as well as from enhanced content design. And Naruto Mobile achieved a new milestone of 10 million average daily active users in May, as marketing activities have boosted its new player acquisition, while enriched theme content has re-engaged its existing user base. Among new releases, DNF Mobile has emerged as one of the most successful mobile games in China. The game reactivated millions of DNF IP fans, and more importantly for long-term success, we're seeing high user retention rates due to proven gameplay, abundant content, and active local publishing, which together positioned the game to become our next evergreen major hit. Need for Speed Mobile, launched in July, is attracting millions of DAUs by providing a range of driving-centric activities within an open-world city experience. Among our international games, PUBG Mobile's DAU and gross receipts achieved double-digit growth year-on-year, -year, driven by the new Mecha Fusion mode, the Golden Moon event, and a lion-themed top-tier outfit. Brawl Stars' gross receipts grew more than tenfold year-on-year. -year. Average DAU achieved a historical high and ranked Brawl as the third highest mobile game across the entire industry by DAU in international markets in the quarter. These achievements flowed from frequent content updates, such as an IP collaboration with Godzilla, and social features, such as the thumbs up for Brawl event. Valorant's MAUs grew year on year, benefiting from high quality content updates, such as New Agent Clove and New Map Abyss, the first Valorant map with no outer boundaries. Two international esports events, Masters Madrid and Masters Shanghai, expanded Valorant's global IP influence. Squad Busters, a casual PvP PvE action game with real-time strategy elements and Supercell character collection, launched on May 29th. Squad Busters has established critical mass in the key North America and Western Europe regions, and Supercell will be adding new game modes and so social features to the game to further expand its fan base worldwide. For online advertising, revenue grew 19% year on year driven by increased ad spend from most categories, particularly games, e-commerce, and education. The deceleration in consumption spending in China is a headwind to advertising eCPM pricing, and thus to our brand advertising and ad network trends. But we believe we'll continue improving our advertising market share, and our advertising business should benefit once consumer spending improves. For our ad tech, we upgraded our machine learning platform to analyze user interests over a longer time horizon of years rather than months, while processing signals more frequently. These changes enable us to gain deeper user insights and provide more relevant ad recommendations, thus boosting click-through rates and revenue. By property, video accounts ad revenue increased over 80% year-on-year, fueled by rising short video engagement as well as demand for live streaming promotions. Tencent video ad revenue grew over 30% year-on-year, despite weak branded ad spend market-wide, as our popular self-commissioned drama series such as Joy of Life 2 and The Tale of Rose attracted sponsorship spend. However, our mobile ad network revenue dropped year-on-year, -year, as certain internet services companies reduced their overall advertising spend. Looking at fintech and business services, segment revenue was 50 billion RMB, up 4% year-on-year. Our fintech services revenue growth slowed to a low single-digit year-on-year growth rate. The number of commercial payment transactions continued to increase at a healthy rate year-on-year, -year, but the average value per payment transaction declined year-on-year -year due to slow consumer spending, causing further moderation in our commercial payment revenue growth. But given the continuing growth in number of transactions, we believe that our market share is quite stable, and we therefore expect our commercial payment revenue to improve once consumer spending picks up. Our consumer loan services revenue decreased year on year, 
as WeBank and Tencent proactively adopted more cautious credit extension policies in light of subdued consumption trends. Our wealth management revenue grew at a double digit year on year due to increases in the number of users and in aggregated customer assets as consumers generally save more and spend less. Turning to business services, revenue grew at a teens rate year on year in the second quarter, benefiting from higher cloud services revenue and increased technology service fees generated from rising video accounts, e-commerce transaction volumes. Business services gross profit rose significantly year on year due to the increased contribution of higher margin revenue streams, as well as improved efficiency. In WeCom, merchants are increasingly willing to pay for advanced communication functionalities, such as customer service chat groups, and WeCom revenue accordingly increased significantly year on year. Tencent Meeting deepened its adoption and monetization, especially in the pharmaceutical, manufacturing, and retail sectors. We're generating increasing AI-related external revenue from customers utilizing our high-performance computing infrastructure, such as GPUs, and our model library services. We recently launched three AI-powered platform solutions for enterprises, image generation engine and video generation engine, which are particularly useful for advertisers creating ad content, as well as knowledge engine, which is particularly useful for finance, education, and retail-related services, deploying customer service chatbots. And now I'll pass to John for the financial review. Thank you, James. Hello, everyone. For the second quarter of 2024, total revenue was 161.1 billion RMB, up 8% year on year. Gross profit was 85.9 billion RMB, up 21% year on year. Operating profit was 50.7 billion RMB, up 40% year on year. Interest income was 3.9 billion RMB, up 13% year on year, driven by growth in cash reserves. Finance costs were 3.1 billion RMB, down 5% year on year due to a reduced debt level. Share profit of associates and JV was 7.7 billion RMB, compared to profit of 1.2 billion RMB in the same period last year. On a non IFRS basis, share profit was 9.9 billion RMB up from profit of 3.9 billion RMB last year, driven by improved performance at certain domestic associates and at certain overseas game studio associates. Income tax expense declined by 9% year on year to 10.1 billion RMB, primarily due to the high base in the same quarter last year, resulting from an overseas subsidiary's deferred tax adjustment. A domestic corporate income tax expense in the second quarter of 2024 increased year on year. On non IFRS financial figures, operating profit was 80, uh, 58.4 billion RMB, up 27% year on year. Net profit attributable to equity holders was 57.3 billion RMB, up 53% year on year. The difference in year-on-year -year growth rates between operating profit and net profit was due to higher non IFRS share of profit from associates and JV, which increased to 9.9 billion RMB this quarter from 3.9 billion RMB same quarter last year, as well as lower income tax due to previously mentioned high base impact. Diluted EPS was 6.014 RMB, up 55% year-on-year, outpacing non IFRS net profit growth due to reduced share count from share buybacks. For the second quarter of 2024, our weighted average number of shares for calculating diluted EPS decreased by 1.9% year-on-year. Moving on to gross margin, overall gross margin was 53%, up 6 percentage points year-on-year. By segment, value-added services gross margin was 57%, up 3 percentage points year-on-year year due to improved margins in long-form video and games businesses, alongside our effective control of operating costs. Online advertising gross margin increased to 56%, up 7 percentage points year-on-year, year, primarily driven by growth in high-margin video accounts advertising revenue and margin improvement in long-form video advertising. FinTech and business services gross margin increased to 48%, up 9% points year on year. This was driven by enhanced cost efficiency in our crowd business, higher contribution from high margin wealth management services revenues, and e commerce technology service fees within video account, and improved monetization of WeCom and other business services. 
On operating expenses, selling and marketing expenses were 9.2 billion RMB, up 10% year on year, driven by increased spending on promotion and advertising for new content release. Selling and marketing expenses represented 6% of revenue stable year on year. R&D expenses were 17.3 billion RMB, up 8% year on year. GNA expenses, excluding R&D, were 10.2 billion RMB, up 8-9% year on year, due to an increase in staff force, including performance-based rewards. At quarter end, we had approximately 106,000 employees, up about 1% both year on year and quarter in quarter. Non IFRS operating margin was 36%, up 5 percentage points year on year, in line with gross margin expansion. To conclude, I will highlight some key cash flow and balance sheet metrics. Operating capex was 7.2 billion RMB, up 144% year on year, driven by investment in GPU and CPU servers. On a quarter on quarter basis, operating capex was up 8%. Non-operating capex was 1.5 billion RMB, up 3% year-on-year, driven by construction in progress. On a quarter-on-quarter basis, non-operating capex was uh, non-operating capex was down 80% from the high base in the prior quarter. As a result, total capex was 8.7 billion RMB, up 121% year-on-year. Free cash flow was 40.4 billion RMB, up 35% year-on-year due to higher gross receipts from gains. On a quarter and quarter basis, free cash flow was down 22% due to a seasonal decline in gains gross receipts for Chinese New Year holiday period. Net cash position was 71.8 billion RMB, down 22% quarter and quarter, primarily due to 34.2 billion RMB share repurchase and 20. 8.9 billion RMB dividend payment for year 2020 during this quarter. <coughs> Both were largely funded by our free cash flow generation. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, we now open up for questions. If you are dialing in by phone, a uh, reminder, please press 5 to raise a question and then press 6 to unmute yourself. If you are accessing from the Chancellor meeting or Google meeting application, please click the raise hand button at, at the bottom. We will take one main question and up to one follow-up question each time. Uh, the first question comes from Alicia Yap from City Group. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, good evening, management. Thanks for taking my questions and congrats on the solid result. Uh, first questions, um, can management elaborate a little bit uh, your recent upgrade of the advertising technology platform? Uh, when management noted on the prepare remark, the upgraded technology will analyze the user interest over a longer time horizon. Um, does that mean you are uh, taking back into the longer historical usage pattern uh, to form more precise targeting uh, attribute and to capture the potential change of the user habits over the years? Um, maybe can you share a little bit the details? And also, how will this upgrade, uh, upgraded ad platform uh, attract higher ad spend and maybe support the future ad revenue growth potential? Uh, second question, um, given there's a recent supportive comments from the state council uh, on the digital content, uh, including gaming and others, um, will that change any of um, the company R&D resource deployment in the coming future uh, in order to help boost small uh, entertainment-related content consumption opportunity? Thank you. Hi, Alicia. Thank you very much for your questions. And uh, I'll uh, attempt to take the first one. So, uh, yes, indeed, uh, we are looking uh, further back uh, at... Um, uh, actions over years rather than months. And, you know, the main benefit is to form a more comprehensive uh, user interest graph. Uh, on the other hand, we're also looking uh, with greater uh, frequency at the most recent uh, actions. And you know, the main benefit of, of the most recent actions is to have a more precise and timely view on uh, you know, users' current commercial intent. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, looking further back uh, and also looking more frequently uh, at the most recent data are both beneficial, but for different reasons. 
And in terms of how the um, processes uh, then attract more advertising spend, uh, you know, but by understanding the user's interest graph better, by uh, having more precision around their current commercial intent, we can improve the click-through rate. And uh, you know, today in, in China and worldwide, you know, as you boost the click-through rate, then the majority of advertisers automatically allocate more advertising spend to you because you're delivering more clicks with the higher click-through rate. Uh, in terms of your second question, <clears throat> I would say uh, obviously the comments is actually uh, supportive and uh, very encouraging uh, to us and our content business, especially uh, the narrative around gaming, which is yet another approval and affirmation of the value of the industry uh, in addition to um, the continued issuance of Banhao. Right. And uh, we felt uh, this is definitely incrementally positive uh, to the overall content industry. But having said that, you know, we uh, have already been making uh, very long term uh, investments and strategic investments in uh, the content industry and the nature of the content industry, be it games or be it drama series which originate from novels is that uh, they are actually very long-term in nature. Uh, so so uh, if you look at the recent uh, uh, revival of our gaming uh, business, as well as uh, the success of our drama series, they really originate from investments that we made uh, years ago. So uh, from that perspective, you know, rest assured that you know, as a, as a you know, major player in the content industry, we have been making very strategic and long-term investments uh, in the content industry, even when uh, the industry was actually in turmoil. Uh, and, and that's the reason why we are now uh, reaping the benefit of our investments. So uh, you know, we're not going to be sort of you know, that short-term oriented, just reacting to one a uh, piece of news, uh, but uh, you know, as a as a important player, we have been making very strategic investments all along the way, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you, thank you, Alicia. Uh, we will take the next question from Kenneth Paul from UBS. Hi, good evening, management. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first is on uh, live streaming e-commerce. Uh, we noticed that there have been a meaningful slowdown in the GMV growth in the short video platform, live streaming e-commerce for the uh, competitor in the recent quarter. Can management share with us the e-commerce strategy for our video accounts? Uh, my second question is uh, on the accounting side, uh, specifically taking into two items. First, uh, for the GNA, which is up 8% on a year-on-year -year basis, um, understand that the headcount is rather flattish on a year-on-year -year basis. So how much of this 8% increase is one-off in nature? And secondly, on tax, um, how should we model the effective tax rate uh, over the next two quarters as it has come down a lot uh, in the uh, this quarter? Uh, thank you. Hi, uh, I'll uh, take the first question. Uh, in terms of at the e-commerce activity uh, in our uh, Weishin uh, ecosystem, uh, so apart from the uh, mini uh, programs e-commerce, uh, just on you know what you would call the live streaming e-commerce, uh, you know our growth uh, in the quarter has still been uh, very solid, uh, a very uh, significant growth. So you know, we're not seeing a slowdown in terms of TME growth uh, relative to the other. Um, short video platforms and and the main reason is because you know the the size of our uh e-commerce gme is actually uh very small compared to uh, the size of theirs um so you know there's still a lot of headroom for us to grow but having said that uh we have recently repositioned our live streaming e-commerce uh to make it more of a weishin uh, e-commerce system in the sense that uh, we are going to build that ecosystem, not just to base a point at the uh, video accounts and uh, live streaming 
uh, channel. Uh, in in instead, you know, we are going to build our e-commerce ecosystem within Weixin, uh, tying to the entire Weixin ecosystem, and that would uh, obviously still draw a try a draw a lot of strength from our official uh, from from our video accounts as well as our live streaming. Um, channel but but at the same time it will be connected to all the elements of the Weixin ecosystem including official accounts including mini programs including uh enterprise Weixin including all the social uh and uh, group activities that are happening within Weixin so that uh we would want to build an ecosystem in a very patient but systematic way uh, so that uh, it will be differentiated from just live streaming e-commerce and it will be much more valuable to the uh, merchants and the users. And we also uh, hope to solve the problem that you are seeing, right? You know, there's a material slowdown in terms of GMV growth because live streaming e-commerce can grow very fast, but then there is a natural slitting. But if we can build uh, the e-commerce ecosystem within Weixin, in the systematic way, uh, leveraging all the uh, source of the strength within Weixin, then you know, hopefully we can actually build a uh, much bigger and meaningful and uh, you know, high ceiling uh, e-commerce ecosystem. And to some extent, this is similar to the way we build our mini programs. You know, for uh, quite a few years, we built the ecosystem uh, patiently, you know, and uh, it doesn't seem like uh, it's generating a lot of revenue, but when it actually unleashes power, uh, it generates a lot of uh, user engagement. It, it uh, becomes extremely valuable to uh, merchants and content providers online and offline, and it becomes a significant source of revenue uh, in many different areas, including mini games as well. Uh, so that's you know, the way we, uh, you know, approach, uh, you know, uh, in e-commerce. Yeah, in relation to G&A expenses, I will split into two parts to explain. R&D expenses increased by 8% year on year in quarter two, while G&A excluding R&D increased by about 8 to 9% also year on year in quarter two, 2024. Uh, in 2012, whole of two. 2024, we expect R&D to increase by high single digit, while GNA excluding R&D also will increase by uh, single digit as well on IFRS basis. So as a result, uh, we expect that, you know, for the full year of 2024 full year, based, of, based on the latest estimate, uh, it will increase by high single digit as well. Uh, in relation to the income tax, the uh, Non IFRS, uh, we should really look at the non IFRS profits. You know, um, uh, we can see that the decrease in income tax expense was due to deferred tax asset reversal in OBC subsidiary in Q2 last year, which formed a lower base for this year comparison. Uh, and it was, of course, part, uh, offset by the increase by uh, domestic income tax. Um, the non IFRS effective tax rate for last year full year was 22%. And we expect that the non virus effective tax rate for 2024 will be uh, within the range of 18 to 20%. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from Miranda Chan from the... Uh, uh, Miranda, your line? So, uh, maybe we will take the. Okay, Miranda, can you hear us? Uh, maybe we move to the next question. Yes, I can hear you oh, now. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thanks for uh, the patience. So, my questions are about the profit. Uh, my key question is about uh, so the new higher margin revenue streams have been driving a strong profit beat for the several quarters. Um, can management update us about the matrix of these uh, higher margin streams? Uh, for example, what are the mix for them uh, in revenue or gross profit? How fast are they growing? How much um, do they contribute to the pro gross profit growth rate? 
And then looking ahead, um, how do you think about the room of further upside uh, to your gross margins of the key business segments? And then my follow-up question about the profit uh, is that uh, we have seen that the share of profit from associates and JVs uh, increased significantly uh, quarter over quarter and also year over year, um, contributing to a significant portion of companies' adjusted profit. Um, so can management um, help us understand what are the drivers? And then as your investees are generally in a profit improving trend, um, shall we expect this line item uh, to contribute uh, to more profit upside and to continue to trend up uh, going forward? Thank you. Thank Miranda. Thank you for the questions. Uh, I'll take the first one in terms of the um, impact of the uh, mixed shift toward higher margin uh, revenue streams. Uh, so, you know, we, we don't, uh, you know, quantify each one of them individually or, uh, you know, the aggregate collectively. Uh, but, you know, one way of uh, visualizing the trend is that uh, in recent periods, uh, uh, gross profit uh, has grown uh, 2.x times as fast as, as our revenue. And, you know, that's been for, uh, you know, two reasons. The primary reason has been, uh, you know, the mixed shift toward these uh, higher margin revenue streams that, that you talked about. Uh, and then the secondary reason has been uh, efficiency initiatives, uh, you know, cost management initiatives. Uh, and, uh, you know, together those have resulted in the multiplier from, uh, you know, revenue growth to 2.x times faster gross profit growth. Uh, you know, looking forward, then, uh, you know, we do assume at some point some of the efficiency initiatives will have uh, yielded the efficiencies that we, we sought to capture. And therefore, that uh, driver of uh, gross profit growth exceeding multiplying revenue growth will, will uh, you know, decelerate. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we believe that the mixed shift to higher margin uh, revenue streams is a phenomenon that you know has uh, you know many years to run, and uh, therefore we think that uh, our gross profit will continue to increase faster than our revenue, uh, but potentially at a one point x times multiplier rather than at a two point x times multiplier. Looking forward, thank you. Yeah, in terms of the share of profit of associates, uh, on an on-gap basis, it increased from 3.9 billion a year ago to 9.9 billion due to contribution from associates like PDD and to a lesser extent, Quaisho and Epic. As the share of associate uh, profit started to pick up from quarter to 2023 and further accelerated in later quarters of 2023, due to the rule of large numbers, we expect that the year-on-year -year growth will reduce to a lower level in the second half of the year. Thank you. Uh, next, we will take the uh, question from Lauren Kahn from uh, Goldman Sachs. Thank you, Pony, Martin, James, John, and Wendy. I want to ask uh, two questions. One is on games, that uh, very big contrast versus last year. This year, we're seeing your reacceleration in domestic international games. You've proactive adjusted evergreen existing games, launch of new titles, and then strong supercell grossing. So how should, how are we planning to, ahead, I think, to smooth, maybe partially smooth this hyper growth trends that we're seeing in the gross receipts momentum um, for investors to see this into a sustained multi-year games revenue growth, just looking at it from a overall portfolio basis, how, how do we want to manage and smooth this very strong trend that we're seeing recently? Um, second, on the investment portfolio, as we talked about, this will be a self-sustaining portfolio for the time being. Uh, what are the likely methods of divestment for mature, uh, more mature assets? Um, some may not be large enough to distribute or some may not be that liquid to sell. How are we thinking on the methods of divestment and then what are the new areas of investment uh, that we are working on? Thank you. Hi, so starting with the second question, uh, if you look at the, the second quarter of this year, then our divestitures uh, were substantially in excess of our gross new investments. So if you take uh, you know, divestitures plus uh, dividends received plus fund distributions received, 
then uh, you know that was was over fifty percent greater than the uh, capital we deployed in in new investments. So the portfolio is indeed self funding. Uh, in terms of our ability to conduct divestitures, then um, you know, the majority of our portfolio value is in uh, listed companies and. Uh, much of it is in, in you know, relatively uh, large and liquid listed securities. And so in the second quarter, you know, we divested uh, well over a billion dollars by uh, selling shares on the market. And you know, I think that trend can, can continue. Uh, on the first question about games, so you know, we don't uh, aspire to smooth out uh, our game gross receipts growth necessarily, uh, and you know, from a, a reported perspective, uh, our financial results smoothed themselves out because we uh, defer the gross receipts into our profit and loss. Uh, in some cases, o- over the course of several years, uh, and so uh, you know that that in and of itself exerts a naturally smoothing ability. But you know, that's an accounting necessity. It's not a, a business choice on our part. Uh, but you know, I think in terms of the underlying question behind your question, that you know we, we are experiencing a step up because of uh, Dungeon and Fighter Mobile, and so how do we sustain the underlying step up? I'd make a few points. One is that uh, you know Dungeon and Fighter Mobile is one contributor, but we also had other contributors. Uh, you know, if we uh, look purely at the, the China revenue, then actually the launch of uh, Valorant in China contributed almost as much to our year-on-year revenue growth as, as the launch of. Uh, DNF mobile this quarter. Uh, so it's not DNF mobile in isolation. And then, you know, looking forward, um, we, we have the uh, rebooting that we've done with two of our biggest games that we talked about, uh, yielding positive results this quarter, which we expect to continue yielding positive results going forward as those two big games become more and more platform-like and the injection of new game modes such as Metro Royale or Extraction Shooter into those platforms uh, drives further user and, and uh, gross receipts growth. Uh, we have you know, the ongoing growth that we've talked about in some of our you know, newer evergreen games, uh, such as uh, League of Legends Wild Rift. Um, we have uh, and, and, team, and uh, Fight for the Golden Spatula. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, you know, a number of games in the pipeline uh, that we're optimistic about, uh, you know, whether that that's, uh, you know, a Delta Force or a Path of Exile 2 or a One Piece uh, that we believe, you know, have the potential to become uh, evergreen games in their own right going forward as well. So that's how we think about, uh, you know, driving uh, continued growth uh, for our game business over the long term. Yeah, I would just add uh, to that and basically saying, you know, it, we, we did have a, a good quarter and uh, the traction is actually sort of, you know, quite nice. But, you know, let's not lose sight of the fact that, you know, it, it, we have, uh, you know, seen very challenging business environment in the past uh, couple of years. Uh, and, you know, that's really the nature of the gaming business, right, which is, uh, number one, uh, it's, it's increasingly difficult to come up with the very successful new titles these days because the quality of the games and the, the, the expectation of the gamers are very high. And at the same time, the quality and the franchise value of existing titles are very strong. So that, you know, if you want to launch a new game, you actually sort of, you have to come up with really good quality in or, or very differentiated gameplay in order to attract users. Uh, and as such, um, you know, we just need to work very hard to uh, come up with good new titles. Uh, while at the same time, you know, we do think uh, that the existing franchises are actually becoming uh, more and more uh, sustainable. Uh, but having said that, you know, in order to grow existing franchises, we also have to sort of, you know, keep on innovating. And uh, as a result, getting our users uh, excited and overall i would say the gaming industry is still uh have got a lot of potential but then it's to some extent cyclical because you know when there's a dearth in innovation or new supply or uh new excitement then you know it seems to be in doldrum and then when there is a new uh wave of new innovation 
then you know the the gaming business suddenly sort of you know and the industry suddenly expand right you know and and we just you know, have to you know continue to work very very hard in order to drive innovation and we felt if we can do that we can actually grow this business over a longer period of time uh but uh you know ourselves as well as investors probably need to recognize that fact that you know there's going to be some cyclicality in the gaming business uh you know when when there's smaller years when there's less innovation then it grows less and, you know when there's sort of you know suddenly a, a big uh, uh emergence of innovation then it will grow faster got it thank you martin and james thank you uh, we will take the next question from ali jang from macquarie Thank you so much, uh, management, for taking my questions. Uh, I have two. Number one uh, is really on the advertising uh, uh, segment. So second quarter, uh, we've delivered 19% growth, seemed much more resilient versus the prior expectations, especially uh, considering, you know, in the opening remark management, you pointed out uh, the, the impact on the advertising pricing under the current environment. Uh, just wondering what we have done differently, both with uh, video accounts and the other ad formats and how we have observed the advertiser's behavior shift uh, under the current uh, dynamics and how we're planning to defend the, the macro volatilities. Uh, the second one uh, is really on the AI integration uh, uh, progress within our ecosystem. Uh, we already heard some exciting upgrades uh, with the advertising segment. Just wondering uh, if anything else you could share, such as uh, the large language model training progress, uh, application explorations, opportunities, and how we uh, plan to strategize uh, to further uh, bump up the efficiency and adoption. Thank you. So I'll take the advertising question, and um, you know we, we haven't made dramatic changes. We're just continuing to execute along our path, uh, and um, you know, we, we are benefiting from uh, deployment of uh, neural network artificial intelligence on a GPU infrastructure to boost the click-through rate on on our advertising inventory. Uh, you know we are benefiting from uh, a uh, mix shift of uh, advertising within Wei Xin increasingly being of a closed loop nature and all our SQL, as you can see from the big e-commerce marketplaces and short video services, uh, closed loop advertising tends to uh, achieve higher, um, uh, both higher uh, CPM, but also higher click through rate uh, versus non closed loop advertising. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we have the potential to benefit from releasing more inventory, especially in video accounts. Uh, but in reality, in the first half of the year, we didn't uh, release incremental inventory. So uh, the growth that we experienced was more a function of the, the first two uh, features. Well, in terms of AI, I, I would say, you know, we look at AI as, you know, a more complete suite than just large language model you know there there are uh, the neural networks machine learning based uh, recommendation engines which we use for content recommendation video recommendation as well as ad talking in the ads and content uh use case which is uh you're already delivering very good results right? if you take video accounts as an example uh, by using AI, we actually are able to deliver better content and that generates more use time, a, a, you know, a, a pretty big part of the growth, uh, in terms of the video accounts user time is actually driven by, uh, better targeting, better recommendation. And, uh, you know, that's in turn driven by AI. Uh, and at the same time on the ad, uh, recommendation and, you know, if we can actually increase conversion by 10%, right? You know, that, that's sort of, you know, pretty modest, uh, improvement. Then, you know, the revenue actually grows, you know, quite a bit, right? So I think, you know, that's, uh, areas in which, uh, we're leveraging AI to deliver, uh, material and uh, tangible commercial results. Um, in addition, uh, in the area of games, we are actually, you know, using AI to bridge the gap between PVE and PVP, right? You know, so, you know, when you have games which allow people to 
play against other players, but at the same time, sometimes you actually want to create a game mode in which a player actually play against uh, the machine, right? You know, then uh, in the past, the machine is actually quite dumb, right? And with AI, we can actually make the machine play like um, a real player, and we can actually sort of, you know, have it to play at varying uh, levels of skills and make the, the user experience and the gameplay very fun. Um, so I think you know those, those are the areas which are not LLM, but you know generating very tangible results for our businesses. Now, in terms of LLM, uh, the key thing for us is actually improving the technology. And you know, as we shared before, we have already built an MOE architecture model, which is performing uh, as one of the top. Uh, models in China, and and you know when compared with international models on Chinese language, I think you know, we're at the top of the the pack, and we are uh, you know, deploying uh, our our LLM uh, in in Yuanbao, right? You know, which is a, a, an app that we have launched, which allowed users to uh, interact with our. A large language model in multiple ways, and one uh, way is is uh, uh, enhanced search functionality, so that uh, users can actually uh, you know ask a question, and based on search results, we can actually provide very direct answer to uh, the the questions that uh, our our users pose, and so we have rolled it out to a large enough sample size uh, to get uh, user feedback and the feedback so far has been uh, quite positive but of course at the same time we're also receiving a lot of uh, constructive feedbacks and then we're using that to keep improving our product as well as our model and uh you know over time uh, yuan bao uh you know when it gets to a certain level of of uh, quality then you know we're going to increase our promotional resources and uh, try to get more users into the app and at the same time when it gets to uh, an even better level of uh, expertise then we can actually start incorporating it into uh, different parts of our ecosystem uh, we have a lot of apps which actually uh, has got um, uh, you know interaction uh, use cases which we can leverage our generative ai technology and uh, you know we would uh, be be incorporating our tool into those use cases at the time when the quality of our product is good, and at the same time as uh, we continue to improve the efficiency of the model, so that you know these uh, these products can be uh, delivered to the users at a cost effective way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we will take the next question from Alex, Alex Yao from JP Morgan. Uh, thank you, management, for taking my question and congrats on a strong quarter. Uh, my first question is regarding DNF Mobile. Uh, the game has achieved a strong initial momentum since the launch in late May. How do you guys think about uh, the sustainability of this game? I'm asking because this is not a typical uh, tactical esports game, uh, such as Honor King or Peacekeeper Elite, uh, that we have a lot of uh, expertise, domain knowledge, and execution track records. Um, so, given the genre the nature of the game, uh, what's the um, strategy and the outlook for um, the game's sustainability? And then second question is regarding uh, fintech. Uh, the growth rate of the fintech business was negatively affected by a slow consumption environment uh, and also high price uh, sensitivity among consumers. Um, have you observed the consumption behavior change in terms of financial product transaction on Weixing platform? If so, are these changes structural or cyclical? Thank you. Hi, Alex. Thank you. Uh, on uh, Dungeon and Fighter Mobile, we're uh, very optimistic about the sustainability. Uh, you know, the first reason is that, uh, you know, there is the Dungeon and Fighter PC game you know, that has sustained uh, at a high level, a very high level for 16 years. Uh, and so I think that, um, you know, we believe we do have expertise in operating this kind of game. We've done it for 16 years successfully with Dungeon and Fighter PC, and now we're extending it to a new platform. 
Uh, in a secondly, uh, we can see that um, in the 60 odd days since launch, Dungeon and Fighter Mobile has a very good retention rates. Uh, and, um, you know, of course, retention rates can, can, you know, fluctuate over time, but actually the first 30 days of a game's uh, life, uh, those, those uh, you know, first 30 day retention rates are historically very good leading indicators uh, for which games would enjoy the greatest longevity. And so, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, League of Legends or Team Fight Tactics or Peacekeeper Elite or Honor of Kings, uh, you know, what marked them out in their first 30 days was not how many users downloaded the games, was not how much revenue they generated. It was the, uh, you know, high retention rates that they were displaying among those users who, who had in installed and begun playing the game. And, uh, you know, we're also seeing uh, very good retention rates for uh, DNF Mobile. Uh, and of course, you know, because the DNF Mobile game has been in development uh, for an unusually long period, there's a very heavy uh, content pipeline over the next two to three years that's already set up uh, that will be progressively released. And of course, during those two to three years, uh, you know, Nexon and we will be working on uh, a content pipeline for subsequent years. But the game is in an unusual situation where, uh, because of its unusually long development pipeline, there's now an unusually long uh, post-release content pipeline that's uh, already uh, ready to release uh, as and when we choose to do so. Um, so that's on uh, DNF Mobile. So on FinTech, uh, if we... You dissect into different uh, businesses, right? The payment business is definitely very tied to consumption growth, and as you can see uh, in the official data, consumer uh, consumption growth in China is actually kind of weak. And we also clearly see that uh, in our payment business, uh, in the sense that uh, we we saw a continued growth in terms of the number of transactions. So uh, the number of transactions on the commercial side continue to grow double digit. But uh, on the other hand, the average transaction value has decreased, which is contrary to before, uh, in which we have seen a pretty consistent growth in terms of average transaction value over a very long period of time. So uh, we felt this is uh, a clear demonstration of the fact that uh, consumers are getting much more budget conscious. And um, so that's that's on the payment side. Uh, in terms of the credit, uh, we we do see consumers actually wanting to borrow more uh, at this point in time. But then uh, the revenue actually uh, decreased because we proactively control the amount that we lend out, and we then lend out because uh, we uh, want to tighten uh, the credit uh, at this point of time when uh, the macro uh, uh, you know, and consumption is kind of weak. And uh, on the other hand, uh, wealth management actually uh, increased because um, you know, a lot of consumers, instead of spending, uh, they actually uh, save more uh, during uncertain times. Uh, so these are the dynamics that's happening across the different product areas within fintech. We felt this is uh, more cyclical rather than structural because uh, it's uh, somewhat tied to the uh, weak consumption uh, pattern that's happening in the uh, overall market. And as a result of that, we have seen uh, the government actually rolling out uh, very proactive policies to encourage consumption. And we felt with these rolled out uh, of uh, uh, such policies, at some point in time, uh, the uh, con consumer sentiment, uh, as well as the economy, will start turning. You know, because uh, as evidenced in the wealth management service, right? It's not as if like people don't have money. People actually sort of have money, but they choose to save rather to spend. And uh, if the government policies can actually induce more confidence among the consumers and start revitalizing different parts of the economy, then we felt at some point in time, consumer sentiment would turn and that would be good for our fintech business. Thank you. Uh, next, we will take the question from Xiaoling Liu from HSBC. Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, Martin mentioned uh, that the bar for game quality and expectations have only gone up and turned more demanding. Um, can management discuss where we are in the investment cycle for AAA titles? And can you please give us an update on latest progress and whatnot? Uh, that's the first question. And separately, we have seen that cross-pollination of literature uh, or you know existing PC games IP has played uh, quite a vital role for driving growth in long uh, videos as well as for mobile games. Um, Honor of King World is obviously a highly anticipated title. Uh, what is the progress there? And can management also discuss what other IPs in the reserve would you expect to see similar potential uh, in capable of driving more revenue potential across digital content segments? Thank you. I think, uh, you know, the second question, uh, you know, we, we've talked about some of the uh, other IP based games that we're excited about earlier in this call and also at length uh, at, at the um, fourth quarter results call. So I would you know, refer back to that. But you can also, you know, look at um, what games we have that have become dramatically successful on PC, such as, you know, Valorant, uh, which is now the biggest PC game in China. And, you know, of course, we'd like to bring you know, that to mobile and that recently secured it. It's a Van Howell publishing license in China. And you can look, uh, if you're so inclined, at, you know, some of the interesting uh, IP being generated by China literature and being generated by uh, Tencent Comics and speculators, to, you know, whether that IP would, uh, you know, make sense as, as the basis for games as well. Uh, so that's on the second question. In terms of the first question, uh, I'm not sure that there's a cycle per se in AAA game development. You know, I think there's more of a relentless trend where you know the game industry is only becoming you know bigger, uh, and therefore uh, you know the budgets associated with with the best games are also only becoming bigger, and uh, you know we need to uh, you know play uh, in that arena, and, and you know that's what we're doing, and so we, we have. Um, you know, being continually uh, creating a large number of games, as you know, uh, you know, we expense those costs through our, our P&L. We don't capitalize them. And so what you see is sort of what you get in terms of the uh, income statement, uh, you know, tracking the cash flow quite closely. And, um, you know, we are indeed uh, investing in a large number of, uh, you know, what we believe will be very high quality games. You know, as to defining which ones uh, you know, triple A versus which ones uh, are more um, uh, systems based, then, uh, you know, I think the boundaries are becoming increasingly blurred. If you look at uh, our game Delta Force that's now available for alpha testing on, on Steam and it is quite popular, uh, you know, one of the reasons for the popularity is that within Delta Force, there's a mode that is, you know, very cinematic, you know, classic triple A experience that, that's, um, you know, modeled on the Black Hawk Down incident. Uh, and then there's two other modes, which are much more system-based, uh, you know, an extraction shooter mode and a 30 versus 30 mode uh, that are much more akin to, uh, you know, some of our, our sort of competitive PvP games. And so Delta Force is an example of something that incorporates both the, uh, you know, cinematic AAA experience as well as the uh, competitive PvP experience. If I can add right now, I think AAA is more like a, means not an ends right so so you can you can have a, a play mode driven game you can have sort of you know content driven game and and triple a sort of you know it's probably more geared toward content driven but i think you know for us you know we really want to the ends is actually building game titles to become evergreen titles and over time uh, <laughs> building you know big enough uh, over evergreen titles into platforms and within the platform you would have you know, con you have play mode driven um, uh, uh, content. You, you also have content driven uh, you know, play mode. So, so you know, it, it will be you know interlaced within a, a, a game overall game world. You know, so that's sort of you know what what we felt uh, will be happening, and and we see a big opportunity in the future. Of course, right, you know, it, it would take some time to develop to put more content-driven uh, uh, playing experience uh, into our, our competitive games. And uh, we felt uh, that it could be you know, a, a pretty good opportunity for us to 
get uh, our, our users within our competitive games to be uh, exciting. And over time, right, you know, with the uh, you know, advent of AI, you know, as I said earlier, you know, when we can actually blur uh, the, the, the line between PvP and PvE, then you know, there's actually more opportunity for us along that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we will take the next question from William Packer from BNP Paribas. Hi, management. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, uh, there's been some press speculation around tensions with app store owners in China regarding several factors, for example, fees and external payment systems. This is parallel to what we're seeing in Europe and elsewhere. Could you help us think through the challenges and opportunities across the portfolio? Uh, for example, do you still see upside for the gaming business gross margin from reducing payments? Or in contrast, should we be more cautious for elements of the WeChat ecosystem? Any color appreciated. Thank you. Um, so, so that's quite a um, dense question. And, you know, my answer may or may not sort of reflect all of the, the density. But let, let me attempt to answer. So, um, you know, there are indeed, you, you know, naturally tensions uh, between the uh, game industry or the digital content industry versus app stores and you know the root cause of the tensions is that you know the app stores uh, charge you know what the game industry feels is, is a very onerous burden of 30 percent on games and other forms of digital content of course the uh, you know app stores would argue that you know, they provide a beneficial ecosystem that is supportive of this digital content but then the game industry would reply that you know that ecosystem uh, if it benefits uh, digital content, it also benefits all sorts of other goods and services. And so why is it the case that, uh, you know, the burden of funding the ecosystem falls uh, disproportionately entirely onto the digital content providers and, you know, not at all onto all of the other goods and services providers who, who we could the ecosystem. Um, so, you know, I think that's, you know, the general backdrop and, and you know, over time, uh, you know, both for regulatory reasons and for, you know, business reasons, uh, you know, there is a trend uh, toward the, the app store take rate, uh, you know, reducing uh, uh, over time. Uh, in terms of, you know, our position, then, uh, as you're aware, for the Dungeon and Fighter mobile game, you know, given uh, the strength of the IP, given the fact we knew that, the most enthusiastic players will will seek out the game and uh, you know download it from a URL, whether it's in a, an Android app store or not. Uh, we we made the decision for that specific game uh, to work mostly with uh, you know internal channels uh, rather than with the uh, onerous uh, Android app store channels. And you know we're very happy with that decision. It's you know beneficial for for our returns. Uh, and you know, we think it's, it's fine in terms of user experience. But you know, there will be other games we release in the future with different characteristics where we're seeking to build an audience from scratch, where you know, we look forward to continue to cooperate with you know, the App Store operators. Um, so you know, that's in terms of um, uh, you know, new game releases. Uh, your question, I think, also was you know, touching on some of the press commentary around uh, you know, mini games on, on iOS. And, you know, I think there's been some misunderstandings there about the uh, you know, nature of the, the current situation, which is that, you know, today we don't monetize, uh, you know, mini games on iOS through, through in-app transactions. Uh, you know, I think it would be in uh, our interests, in Apple's interests, but, you know, more so uh, for, for the game developers and the users' interests if that monetization uh, were made available, uh, but, you know, we want to make it available on terms that, you know, we think are economically sustainable and, and that are also fair. Uh, and so, you know, that's a discussion that's underway, and we hope that the discussion uh, leads to a positive outcome because, you know, it would be a win-win-win. Uh, but in the event that, uh, you know, the discussion doesn't progress, then you know, the current status quo continues. Uh, in the event that the discussion does progress, then, you know, that's, uh, you know, incremental revenue, uh, you know, for us, incremental revenue for uh, game developers, uh, potentially incremental revenue for Apple, and, and certainly a better experience for Apple users. Thank you. Uh, we will take the next question from Thomas Chow from Jeffries. 
Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, thanks, management, for taking my question. Uh, my first question is about our cloud business. Uh, given that, uh, I think in the prepared remarks, we talk about the AI-related revenue from high computer infrastructure, model library service, and also our AI solution for enterprise. I just want to get some more color with regard to our cloud revenue. Uh, what are our thoughts about the contribution uh, from AI uh, going forward? And uh, my second question is about uh, capital return. Um, considering the macro uncertainties these days, uh, any thoughts about uh, upsizing uh, our share repurchase uh, program? Thank you. So on the first question, um, you know, clearly for the U.S. hyperscale cloud providers, uh, you know, renting out GPUs uh, to um, you know other companies with with AI requirements has you know become a very big business. Uh, you know, in China, the same trend is evident, but to a lesser extent. Uh, you know, to a lesser extent because you don't have the same you know multitude of uh, you know extremely well funded. Uh, startups uh, trying to build large language models on their own in, in, in China. Uh, you know, there are many small companies, but, you know, they're capitalized at a billion dollars, two billion dollars. They're not capitalized at, you know, 10 billion dollars or 90 billion dollars, uh, the way that some of the, the giant U.S. Uh, VC funded startups are now capitalized in the space. Uh, you know, and uh, it, it's, uh, you know, also a, a somewhat challenging economic environment. Uh, now that said, you know, we have seen that, uh, within our cloud, um, you know, the, uh, demand from customers for renting GPUs for their own AI needs ha has been growing very swiftly. Um, you know, the percentage growth rates are very fast, but, you know, they're very fast partly because, uh, it's a low base. Uh, and also partly because while some of that demand for, uh, renting GPUs in the cloud is, is incremental, some of it is replacing demands that would otherwise have existed anyway for renting CPUs in the cloud. Uh, and so while the uh, business of, of uh, you know, GPU provision is doing very well, uh, the business of uh, you know, CPU uh, processing uh, is more flat uh, because the incremental demand uh, is for uh, you know, GPU, not CPU. Well, in terms of share buyback, uh at this point in time, uh, we are continuing with our uh, previously communicated share buyback program, and there's uh, no update for now. Thank you. Thomas, uh, we will take the last question from Gary Yu from Morgan Stanley. Hi. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask questions. Um, my first question is regarding domestic games. Uh, again, a follow up on DNF. Um, I think management mentioned that we expect this to be the next evergreen, um, major hit. How should we look at the longevity and scale on a sustainable basis versus the other two evergreen games in terms of, you know, amount of DAU or revenue potential in a kind of longer term relative to kind of honor of cane and peacekeeper elites? Uh, and my second question is related to um, macro. Uh, I think man management indicated that we have started to see some negative impact on payment. Um, how has the recent trend uh, uh, been looking like? Uh, so have we seen, you know, you know, a stabilized trend or uh, things are getting worse? And also um, we noticed that games and the Tencent own ad property seems to be very resilient under this kind of macro environment. Um, how sustainable uh, do we think we can kind of keep up the, the, the current resiliency in, in, in the games and advertising business in particular? Thank you. Hi, Gary. On uh, Dungeon and Fighter Mobile and, you know, triangulating it versus, uh, you know, our, our um, historically two biggest games as well as other games that are in the market, then, you know, th this is probably stating the obvious, so I apologize. But, you know, as a narrative rather than systems based game uh you know one would naturally expect uh you know a, a lower uh daily active user base uh for dnf mobile than you know one would for more systems based games such as uh honor of kings or peacekeeper or elite uh you know on the other hand as a narrative not system based games one would expect uh a substantially higher arpu for for dungeon fighter mobile uh than for those system based games in addition because Dungeon and Fighter Mobile is sort of building on 
you know, 16 years of, of legacy and specifically of, uh, you know, many people who played Dungeon and Fighter PC, you know, 16 years ago when they were in college and you know, n- are now, you know, working and, and, you know, quite affluent, but only have time to play games on mobile phones. The, you know, spending power of those users is, is uh, you know, also greater than it would be for you know, games that appeal to more of a 20 something user base. And, and so both the nature of the game being more narrative based, as well as the nature of the audience being a, a more mature audience, are conducive to, uh, you know, higher ARPU. Now, that said, if you compare, uh, you know, Dungeon and Fighter Mobile with other narrative based games uh, in, in the China market, then you know, the user base, the number of DAUs is, is dramatically larger. Uh, you know, the game actually has, has a big audience for a narrative based experience. And, uh, you know, we believe that will continue given the nature of the game, given the high retention rates I talked about earlier. Uh, and, you know, while the ARPU is, you know, higher than it is for our biggest systems based games, it, it's, you know, lower than for many narrative based games in China. We think the monetization is fair and sustainable, again, especially in light of the uh, you know, nature of the audience for Dungeon and Fighter Mobile. In terms of macro, uh, I would say what we saw is actually pretty consistent with the official consumption number, which is uh, you know the second quarter is actually a, a slowdown from the first quarter. Uh, so I think you know that's the current trend. Uh, we felt you know, with the government rolling out uh, you know more uh, proactive policies and more expansionary policies, uh, then uh, over time, uh, given the resilience of the overall um, uh, industry as well as uh, entrepreneur environment in China, uh, then. Uh, we should uh, over time see a uh, recovery in terms of uh, the economy as well as uh, consumer uh, consumption. So that's, that's what we believe in. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, 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 the weather, you know, at what t- it's not a matter of weather, right? It's a matter of when, you know, and we just sort of have to uh, wait a little bit to see when uh, the uh, uh, inducive policies would actually start yielding results. Now, in terms of games, I would say uh, for our games, which are uh, essentially large DAU, long engagement games, uh, we uh, have pretty low spending per unit of time. And as a result, we felt uh, this is actually quite resilient in the uh, overall uh, macro environment. Uh, And... uh, you know, the, the, if we are to see any issue, it probably will be, uh, in the low DAU, high Apple games, which are not necessarily Tencent games. And, uh, you, you might want to look at those games as proxies. And overall, we felt, uh, you know, of course, part of the, uh, gaming industry is actually driven by, uh, macro environments, which, you know, we felt g- given sort of the low spending per unit time, there probably is, is still some headroom before we hit that. Uh, the more important driver is actually innovation, as I've continually repeated a couple of times. So, you know, when there is uh, continued innovation in the gaming industry, then we felt uh, the market would expand, uh, even if the macro environment is actually challenging. Thank you, Martin. We are now ending the webinar. Thank you all for joining our results today. If you wish to check out our press release and other financial information, please visit the IR section of our company website at www.tencent.com. The replay of this webinar will also be available soon. Thank you and see you next quarter.